people I've ever spoken to. So whatever you guys are taking, whatever drugs, awesome. It's fantastic. Coffee, whatever that is. Um, can you guys give it up for Converge? I mean, really? Good job. I mean, it's a good conference, right? You guys having a good time? Excellent. Everyone stand up. I'm sorry, you have to. Everyone stand up. Okay, one of the biggest problems that I have when I go to a conference is, is that a lot of people say that I'm trying to break in, and this is my first time here, and I don't know anyone. So right now, turn to somebody, introduce yourself, say hi. You can either sh ha shake hands, hugs, or punch the person. <laughs> All right, that's enough. Sit down. All right, now all y'all that ate lunch by yourself yesterday, you don't have any excuses. You have someone to go eat lunch with today, okay? All right, my name is Ben Ten. Uh, no, Ten is not my real last name. It's just my real last name is difficult to pronounce, so Ten's easier. Um, so I am a secu senior security consultant with TrustedSec. Um, I've actually been doing uh, technology and everything for a long time. I know I look really young and I sound really young. Uh, you know, I went with my son to a conference one time, and he introdu introduced himself. He's like, "Yeah, you know, this is, you know, my, I'm really into computers. I'm a lot like my dad." The big difference between me and my dad is I'm supposed to be this short. <laughs> so I did, I've been doing development for about 20 years. I started when I was 12. One of the first games I wrote was a 2D side-scrolling game. And it was really, it was a lot of fun. Um, I, I did it when I was a junior in high school. And the, the, you know, the objective was just to see if I could do collision, type of tracking the bullets and destroying the little guys. But uh, my teammate and I, we, we, we thought it would be a lot more fun if we made the game a little bit more interesting. And so because we knew the professor was going to put this on his computer and test it. So what we did is we put code in there that every time that you destroyed one of the bad guys, it would randomly delete one of your files. So the longer the professor played, his computers, and this was back in like 98, 97, when AV really wasn't there. And so, like, it deleted uh, boot.ini, autoexec that bad. <laughs> so it, we still got an A. It was all good. <laughs> um, then I went and did infrastructure for 13 years. Um, I also did blue team at that point, uh, doing a lot of defensive methodologies, uh, coming up with different ways to protect and defend. Um, I eventually got all the way up to a vice president. Um, I don't wish that on anyone. Um, it's a lot of responsibility. Uh, Glad I'm not really doing it anymore. And then I decided I was going to make a change. I was like, either this is what I was going to do for the rest of my life, or I'm going to try something new. So I took a pay cut. I took a, you know, I was basically writing my own ticket, could do whatever I wanted. But I'm like, you know what, I need to learn something new. And so I decided I was just going to move and I was going to go to the offensive side because I figured I want to learn the different aspect of this field. So I'm like, hey, I'm going to go and learn pen testing. Um, so, so that's kind of what we're talking about today. Um, one of the people, a lot of what people know about me is I do PowerShell. Um, I'm currently writing a book with no starch. Uh, it's Gray Hat PowerShell, how to use PowerShell for good and bad. Um, walk, basically walk you through all of that. Um, I used to be a Chicago resident, so this is Chicago in summer. Um, at least that's the way it feels for me. Um, I couldn't stand it anymore. I was there for a long time. Uh, so I went up and, uh, so now I'm a Dallas person. Um, so it's a lot better there. I was in a t-shirt in the middle of, you know, on Christmas. I know I said that to somebody, they're like, yeah, I did that too. It was just that it was 34 below, but it was fine for me. Um, and then so now I get to travel around the world, and uh, this is Martin Boss and me. We were on our way to Budapest, Hungary, and uh, this was the Sky Lounge. Um, we did not do this, but we took credit for it. Um, but basically, like, this is their Windows XP licensing thing. So let me give you a little bit of background on security. Okay, so I started in this industry and I really wasn't doing security. I was just doing infrastructure. I was happy in my little world. I was doing development. All was good. And then we had somebody break into our location. Physically broke in. Stole hard drives, everything else like that. Now the nice thing was is that I had already begun to 
do some sort of uh, uh, security, and I put TrueCrypt on them. So even though they walked away, it, was, it wasn't that big of a deal. But Jason Street said the best way to get somebody excited about fire insurance is to burn down the building next door. Right? Because you see that, and you're like, that could be us. Well, I realized that when, when they broke in, I realized, hey, this could have been a lot worse. We could have had a data breach. Now I need to understand some of this stuff. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. Things are burning, but I'm cool. Like, that's all right. Let's go figure things out. Let's see what's going on. So I was like, well, let's go figure out this security stuff. So I started going to con conventions. You know, my first convention I'd ever go to, I hadn't heard about B-sides, hadn't heard anything. This was the very first convention I'd ever gone to. And I knew nobody. No one knew me. I didn't know anything about anything. And so then I was like, I need to start learning things. And I would go to talks, and you'd see these people do some awesome and crazy things. And I'm like, I have no idea what you just said. You're really, really cute. But I don't know what you're saying. And then I would be like, i got to go home and figure this out. So then I learned about the defensive stuff. Well, Jason Street, uh, I picked him up from the airport in Chicago. And on the way to B-Side Chicago, we were talking. And he's like, well, why aren't you presenting anything? And I'm like, I really don't have anything to share. He's like, that's bull. You do have something to share. You do something at your organization that I have no idea about. Do you feel like you're even quasi-successful? And I'm like, well, yeah, we, I think so. We're doing this new user initiative that I started where we're training our users differently than what most people are doing. He's like, well, why don't you present on that? So I did. And this is what it looked like that first year. Oh, let's see, do I have sound? Well, I might have to just hold this to this. Hold on. And not, I don't have it hooked up. Hold on a second. I'll hold this down here. OK, so let's, st let's stand over here, because uh, we need to do something. So uh, I, I do know Lopi, uh, but let's just for this instance, let's just pretend that you and I don't know each other. OK? Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about a new security procedure that I want you to do. Now, the thing about it is, is you have to do it right now, or I'm kicking you out of my talk. Okay, so now most people would be like, all right, I'm leaving because I don't know who you are. Not only did I you know, choose him, but he actually wore the same shirt that I did that wear. So this took totally set up. So I'm like, thanks for wearing the same shirt, dude. If you, don't, if you didn't know me, though, what would probably be your first response? You have to do this right now in front of all these people. Right now, or I'm kicking you out of my talk. This is my first talk. I'm nobody in the infosec industry. What would probably be your response? And he, he still didn't. Like, he wasn't catching on that I wanted him to say, I'd just leave. He's like, I'll do it. I'm a boss. Okay. And like, all right, most, well, people would probably, most people would probably just say, see you later. Who are you? You're Ben 10. Who cares? Now, let's try this. And let's see if this works a little bit better. OK, so I want to do an example for uh, my talk here. And to do that, I want you to do something with me. Now, I, this, is a security, this is a new security thing, and I want it to be done. And I know it's going to be a little bit different for you. But however, if you do it with me, hold on. I'll give you $50. I did this talk like six times, and then my wife told me I couldn't do it anymore because it was so expensive. <laughs> OK, so there's $50. All right. So here we go. This is the new security model that everyone's going to be working on. Now, just also to frame this, there's two other talks going on at the same time, and I made sure my volume was as loud as possible. Open Gangnam Star. Give Chris a big hand here. You guys still hear me now? So that was fun, and that was exciting, and a lot of people, a lot of people saw what I had to say, and they're like, "That's amazing! That's a really cool idea." 
I had never thought about maybe incentivizing my security awareness programs instead of it always being about penalizing the person when they do something wrong. I'm actually going to try and incentivize when you do something right. It's amazing. And I realized that because when I have, with my kids, I find out that I actually get them to do what I want them to do when it's an incentive based off of, I'm going to punish you if you don't. And it changed, it revolutionized our organization in that people were actually excited about the security program. They actually wanted to be a part of it, and it was a cool competition. And I shared this with everyone. And that's part of what came into it. Well, then I decided I was going to do a little bit more and kind of look at the vulnerability management side and, and figure out how I could do like a self-assessment on myself. An internal red team of one, I guess you could say. It wasn't even a red team. It was just more of vulnerability management, identifying it. Uh, my wife was not too happy with the talk title. But that was the idea. And I had tried a lot of different things. I'm like, yes, I'm going to learn how to hack myself. And I actually did. This was my first uh, execution-with Metasploit, not realizing that I wasn't supposed to use the example of 127.001. But hey, I got shell, so it's good. Right? But then I started to decide, I'm like, well, I need to try different things. So I tried a new tool that I downloaded from the internet, and I uh, did it on prod in the middle of the day. This happened. Uh, if you don't know what this is, um, this is uh, LSASS crashing, and it's on a primary domain controller. It took about 30 minutes to come back up. The CEO calls from lunch, because she's out with a client. She's like, hey, we're getting a bunch of issues over there. I'm like, nope, nope, it's fine. Click. And then it was at this point I realized I, I needed to try something else. So I decided I would actually leave and go on and do something else. And so that's when I started going into vulnerability management type stuff. And this wasn't quite red yet, obviously, but we we're still doing the, the help. But I was still trying to learn new different things. You know, learning the different vulnerability scanners, trying to identify, do patch management, all that other fun stuff. And then, and then I was like, I need to expand a little bit more. So I started doing penetration testing. And so because I'm so small, I can fit into suitcases and overhead compartments of airplanes. Uh, when TrustedSec books my travel, I'm always child in lap. <laughs> so I figured I'd start breaking in. And the cool thing about breaking in, especially when you look young, is that people don't take you seriously. You're like, oh, dude, some, someone just brought their kid to work today. Or that kid's lost, or I'm the new intern. So I broke into this organization. They had super tight security, like revolving doors, cards. Like you had your face showed up on the screen when you came in. But the executives, they didn't want to have to deal with that through their garage. So the door would remain open for like, you know, an hour or whatever. Well, I drove right in, sat in the garage, waited for someone to go through, and I walked right in. So I go up and I'm like on all the different floors taking pictures in their data center. And then I see a lunch, like a coffee area. If I break into your place and you have coffee, I'm getting free coffee. So I go over and I start pouring in. People are coming up. They're like, oh, are you the new guy? I'm like, yeah, I'm still learning computers. I'm really not sure what I'm doing. And then one guy comes over. He's like, oh, you're the new guy? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm just starting. You know, I have orientation today. He's like, good. You know, if you, if you watch me and see what's going on, you're going to learn a lot of stuff and you'll go really far. I'm like, oh, man, thanks so much. I, I, I have a lot to learn. He's like, yeah, yeah, no worries. And then he walks away. We go to the recap meeting later on, and we're in this big conference room. And I'm sitting there with my report saying, you know, I just completely destroyed your security. Uh, the dude that walks in was the CTO. Oops. So then, you know, so we're doing a lot of this stuff. So then I decided, uh, Dave Kennedy from TrustedSec, he's like, hey, We've got a position. We really want you on the team. I'm like, I'm not that amazing. I'm still learning. He's like, you have the potential to do a lot of cool things. Do you want to come over? I'm like, yeah, sure. So, so I've moved over to TrustedSec, and so I've been there, love it. But what I've realized in all of my engagements so far, I have realized that a lot of organizations are doing the exact same things on the defense side, which is part of the reason a lot of people are failing. You see, I, th I come up with these great pretexts. Like I could go in as the intern, go in for a job interview, or, or, or I, can, I can pretend I'm the copier guy, or whatever the case may be. But here's the thing, I haven't had to use those pretexts. 
I walk in. And maybe it's because I'm so short I blend in. I don't know what it is, but I don't get stopped. And that's not going to say that's going to be for every place, but that's in the majority of the places that I've gone to, I walk right in. I don't get stopped. And that's not even on the physical side. On the computer side, I'm still walking in electronically, super simple. And we're not talking elite hack stuff here. I'm not writing my own malware. This is simple stuff. So I want to show you first what's wrong. All right? We got to look at some things of what's wrong. So a lot of times when you, when you, you know, you put a SIM or you do any of that type of stuff, you open it up, you get it, and it's kind of like this. <laughs> right? You've got all of this data coming in. Yay, big data. It's all over the place. Right? And then you're trying to figure out how you're going to handle it, how you're going to look at it. Part of the problem is you guys have so much stuff in your environment, and you try and get these silver bullet things, and you can't manage it. So what ends up happening? You ignore it. It becomes shelfware, or you turn it off. And you're like, oh, well, we've got this, but we don't use it. Another big issue. Everyone is using the same password. So LinkedIn breached 2012, right? That's like three years or four years ago now, right? We have the cracked version of just about every single one of those lists. And a lot of y'all used your work email when you signed up for LinkedIn back then. Guess the first thing I do on an engagement now? I test all of those passwords. We have gotten two to four of those that are still active on just about every engagement. If you are still using a password from 2012, that's a problem. There are an immense amount of lists out there. So if you think Monkey 12 or uh, Detroit 16 or whatever you're using, I certainly hope I'm not saying your password right now. <laughs> but if you think that those are super elite, they're not. That's what I'm going to try. I'm going to try the, the I'm going to try all of those passwords. Bef Why am I going to try and brute for something when I've got a list of them? I'd much rather just go through the list. The other thing, default passwords, brocade switches, uh, uh, a lot of your web services, a lot of your Cisco's, a lot of it, all, they're still default passwords. You know the one thing that we love attacking, that in, it's a big Adrian Crenshaw attack, are your MFPs, your multifunction printers. Do you know why we love MFPs so much? Because you guys hook those up to Active Directory. So you hook them up to Active Directory, you give them their own account, but you leave the administrator password the same. So we go in there, and MFPs are really nice. They have this test feature. So we replace the IP with our IP, and then we hit test. Guess what those MFPs do? They send the credentials in clear. So now we have an Active Directory account. All because of an MFP, because of a default password. If you have default passwords on any of your administrative tools, you need to stop and turn that off. We get in this way more than we do any other way. is because you guys left a default password. I would love to say we came up with some awesome, unique hack. There's actually a new one that was just released where you grab the printer driver, you put your back shell into it, re-upload it, and then you uh, set up a fake print server on the network. Well. Every user has the ability to add a printer. So you go into the add printer utility, and you, you use that little wizard. Well, what you don't know is the wizard spawns a second process that runs a system so they can download the driver. Well, so when it downloads my driver with my back door, it's running as system. So now I have a back door because we just added a printer. Like, cool, elite hack, but I'm using default passwords. Like, it's not even, it's not even fun, because I'm still using the same default password. The other problem is, is that the training that you guys are, are, are presenting to your users is not effective. I'm not saying in all its situations, but most cases it's not effective. Because what's the first thing that someone does when they click? Why did you click? You're so stupid, stupid user. I can't believe you clicked. Guess what? It's a business. 
If you're using email, guess what? You have to open things. That's the business. That's the way the business works. The point isn't don't click. It, the point is knowing what you're getting. Having that communication to the user so they fully understand. When you don't teach users well, you get situations like this. Because then they get something that's super powerful that they don't know how to use. So it looks a lot like this. Gloves, leather gloves. Alright, let's have some hands up. He's got one, he's got to set up now. We've got the hammer. Okay, so already you know this. Uh, like a basic uh, okay, so um, how many people that have operated uh, 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 used a firearm? Okay, how many of you are just ready for the next part of this video? Camera action now. No. Now, where is his finger? Where is his freaking finger? Normally you wouldn't do this, but because. Okay, the dude's talking about I I can't hear. That's his first reaction is I can't hear. Not the fact that I just shot my friend. <laughs> so that's what ends up happening. We give people these awesome util tools and utilities and everything else like that, but we don't train them well enough to use them. And then we get upset when they don't use it well. System admins, let's just spin up a box. Just because. We get so many boxes that are sitting out there that y'all forgot about. Okay, I'm Dallas now, I can say y'all. You guys forget about it. You spun it up. A lot of you guys, asset management is a nightmare. You have no idea what's what and where it is. We love to find those boxes because they're typically unpatched because you don't know about them. Developers. Any developers in the room? Okay, gonna yell at you for a second. I need local admin! I can't do my job without it! Well, guess what? I have owned so many developer boxes. And you know what the cool thing about a developer box is? They put so much crap on their systems. Like they copy data, they've got their own instance of SQL Server. It is awesome. I love developers, because I, I, am, I am one. So y'all keep getting sysadmin, that's awesome, because I'm going to get your box. And that's a problem. If you, need, if you need that level, you should be segmented off the network. That's the problem. We're throwing things around out there without realizing that, hey, this could potentially be a problem. Speaking of segmentation, this is typically your uh, network topology diagram. All flat. All connected. Not only is this flat, but you have all of your devices on this, like your Cisco IP phones and your printers and everything else like that. Uh, you know, you've got, and then you, well, we've got NAC. Well, yeah, but I just, I just use a neat little device. Let me show it to you. We've got this awesome NAC. Well, that's great. But I just go over to your Cisco IP phone and I grab your, uh, I grab the, the, the cable and I put a LAN tap on it. So that's all this is. It's a little LAN tap. And what this does is it allows me to, to ride that Cisco IP, for, uh, the RJ45. I just ride that. So MAC address, everything, it, it just rides as the IP phone. And this is something that anyone can get. Any, I, I built this myself. My son's built one of these. Super simple. It's called Throwing Star LAN tap. So, and a lot of people implement, you know, network access control incorrectly anyways. Uh, a lot of times you only need the first six parts of the MAC address and it'll let you on. Right? Because I just need to look like that device. And then that's really going to screw you up, especially if I'm changing my host name and everything to that Cisco IP phone. You're, I mean, how many of you guys are monitoring what your phones are doing? The fact that they're now all of a sudden egressing over HTTP or that your Cisco IP phone is connected over SMB? That could be a problem, folks. But how many of you guys are looking at that? Because you guys are super flat, you're not seeing it. The other problem is that we're not learning. We're not learning from people 
and past mistakes. We see the fact that the building burned down across the street, but we're not doing anything to change our behavior. It's security by obscurity. Well, no one knows about us. Or, uh, or the one I really like is security by divinity. We don't know what we're doing, but we're just praying and hoping to some deity that nothing bad happens. We've actually, uh, I've actually talked to clients that said, my uh, incident response program is to take 1% of all of our profits and to put it in a savings account for when that happens. That's my security model. We're just going to pay for when it does. We, we see the ideas of what's wrong, right? And I think a lot of you guys can empathize with this. I think you see a lot of this stuff in your own organizations, and a lot of you know that it's wrong, but it's frustrating because you can't get things to change. So let me tell you a little bit about the attacker mentality, okay? Because there are some things that you can do on the defensive side to catch me. So the first thing is, I don't like resistance. I want to take the path of least resistance. I don't like to have to work hard, okay? I want to be able to come in, destroy you, and then, you know, go outside and play or do whatever the case may be. I'm lazy. Okay? I want something easy. So when I do this, from your standpoint, when you try and deflect me, it, that only works so well. The thing about it is, is that defense is more about detection than deflection. You're not going to be able to deflect everything. There is a new attack every week. Patch Tuesday. I mean, do anyone think Patch Tuesday is ever going to go away? Anyone ready for next month Patch Tuesday? Are you already ready for it? No, because you don't know what's coming out. There's always going to be something new. There's always going to be a new attack. There's always going to be a new way. And I'll tell you, a lot of the old attacks are working still. Because everyone's focusing on the new glitzy and shiny stuff. That bat to exe is still amazing. I'm still replacing service binaries. Like, it's old school stuff. It's about the detection piece. If you really want to understand how to get a better handle on when someone's got an indicator of compromise on your network, you need to make sure you've got that detection piece. Without it, you have no hope. So how do we do this? How do we set up a path of least resistance? Well, one of the big things is logs, right? Love logs, but if anyone's ever done any type of log management, whatever the case may be, it's like a drinking from a fire hose, right? Well, one of the big hotness is PowerShell, right? A lot of our attacks use PowerShell. It's directly in memory, whatever the case may be. Lee Holmes wrote this blog. Uh, it was like a year ago. Yeah, 2005 or 2015. He wrote this blog. Anyone read it? OK, so PowerShell loves the blue team. Write this down. You need to go and read this article. If you, if you take nothing from this talk, and you have a Windows environment, you need to take this. This will walk you through step by step on how to set up your environment so that you can t detect these types of attacks. It is an amazing blog. And in fact, Lee Holmes was so concerned about this blog that he gave it to Matt Graber, the dude that wrote PowerSploit. He gave it to Will Schroeder, the dude that wrote PowerShell Empire. He gave it to Matt Johnson and to me. We had access to this before it was posted to the public. And we gave our feedback on whether it was legit or not. I was at a Microsoft Ignite conference last year, and I was on the phone with Lee discussing this very thing. That's how concerned he was about this. This is an amazing article. It's been out there for a year, and I've been to many conferences, and people still have not heard about this. Now, here's the thing. You don't want to do this on around 40,000 of your assets. It's going to be a nightmare. It's going to be tough to catch, but you want to set it up on your critical assets first. A lot of people, when they're trying to do this, they're like, I don't know how we're going to do this with 40,000 assets. Well, don't. Do it with your 1,000 critical assets. Do it with the critical infrastructure. Start somewhere. 
Eventually, your maturity model will get to the point where you can expand it. But for now, let's focus on the critical stuff. Your servers, your endpoints, your developers, that's critical stuff, man. The, the areas where you have the highest risk, that's where this needs to go. Expect your deflective controls to fail. That doesn't mean that deflective controls are bad. I still have AV. A lot of people run without AV. Emmet's a great tool, but I still do it. Why do I still have AV? It's because there are still people out there using those bunk, you know, bi uh, viruses that we already have signatures for. So I'm still using that, but I expect it to fail because I bypass AV all the time. I, up, I, I, I got a, access to an ASPX system, and there's a command uh, shell.aspx that you can get off, off the internet. AV already has a signature for it. So you know how do you get around AV with that command shell uh, ASPX? Just press enter and add a new line in, in, the, in the script because it no longer matches the MD5. Like you just have to change the code just slightly and all of a sudden it works again, right? But that's, you have to expect that they're going to fail. So that's where the detection piece comes into play. So I'm going to show you a couple of different things. So I, I, like, sh I like demoing things. I like showing you what's going on. So uh, Dave Kennedy and I were doing a, a, a conference in North or South Dakota. Um, where there's lots of things to do, um, like, you know, looking at corn and snow and cold weather and more snow. Um, so it was super awesome, but we were sitting there, we were doing a, a, a thing, a red versus blue, and while Dave was doing his piece, I decided I was going to write a new tool. I have no idea what Dave said, because I was sitting there writing this new tool, and it's called uh, Invoke Cutting Creds. And it's this cool little PowerShell thing, and basically what it does is um, I impersonate a user. Um, and what the intent is, is to put that user out on the wire. Now I'm going to show you something. Um, raise your hands if you know about Responder. Oh, I have something to show y'all. All right, so Responder is this neat tool, and basically what it does is it'll poison requests over the wire. When I get onto a network infrastructure, uh, this is the, one of the first things I load up. When you don't have a DNS entry, when something's not in the host file, your systems, if by default, unless you've disabled it, will send an LLMNR and an NBNS request saying, hey, uh, this dude Ben is trying to talk to Matt. Does anyone know who Matt is? Anyone? Does anyone know Matt? Matt? Anyone? 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 Well, Responder will actually say, hey, I'm Matt, come talk to me. But before you talk to me, I need you to authenticate. And so what ends up happening is, is that I get your hash when you authenticate. This is invisible to you, by the way. So let me show you. So if I do this, um, please don't take pictures of the next thing that I'm about to do just because it's actually my hash, and I don't want you to get my super awesome password. So if so, uh, let's do this. I know it might be hard to see, but uh, but I'm just going to do this net use. eight graphic cards in there. We set one on fire. Okay? Like we burned, like flames were coming out of the GPUs it got so hot. Right? If it's 14 or fewer, it's not a, it's not a strong password. You guys should really be adopting passphrases, something that goes beyond. It's all about entropy, right? So now we've got this. So 
Does anyone know how you would catch Responder? How would you catch this on your network? Because I'm, 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 I'm on your network, so I'm not going to pass your endpoints. I'm on the same segment, so unless you've got multiple segments trying to do that, how, any idea how you stop this tool? Or how do you catch it? Let me show you. I saw you raise your hand back there, but I'm not going to get, I'm not going to tell you. All right. So what Honeycreds does is, I'm going to go ahead and get this fired up again. So what Honeycreds does is, oops, uh, it allows you to type in a username and password. Now, here's the thing. You don't want your username and password to be something like, ha ha, pen tester, I got you, because I'm not going to use those creds. You want it to make it look like it's legitimate, right? What's some of the most legitimate looking accounts that will typically broadcast these types of things on a continual basis? Service accounts, right? So let's look at this. So let's, so if I do converge slash SCCM updater, right? Does that look legit, like a legit service, right? And that will put a super long password in there. Okay? Now what Honeycreds does is it impersonates that user and then puts it out onto the wire. It'll just sit there and broadcast it and beacon it. Well, Responder, when it's sitting there, it's like, hey, I just saw something new. I'm going to respond to it. Well, and then of course, I'm going to first get the, the hash like I demonstrated earlier. So it's going to try and connect, and then the hash will pop up there on the screen. It takes a few seconds to kind of negotiate everything that's going on. Boom. So there's the hash. But I do something else. I'm like, well, the hash is fine, but what happens if they can't crack it? So then I decide to send you clear text. Now, if I have clear text creds or I have a hash, which one am I going to use first? I'm going to use a clear text. So what you do is you set up an alert, and I'm going to show you this in a second, that the moment that this account is used, you have an indicator of compromise. Now let me show you that on the other side here. The other thing is, you'll get a 200 OK because I sent an HTTP request. The moment that you see 200 status OK, you know you have Responder on your network because there's no service known to man that should be responding to this, especially when you have a bogus account like that. So what happens is, in the event log, you're going to want to write this down. Under security, the event ID is 4648. 4648 is the event ID that you want. Now, as awesome as it is as event log, and I know everyone's in there all day long looking through all of those logs, right? I know I am, because that's awesome. Um, no one's going to be doing this. So I wrote another little tool called Find Malicious Account. Now, uh, PowerSec Framework is a tool I wrote a few years ago. Um, it's meant to be a free, it's open source. It's kind of like a, uh, you know, poor man's IDS uh, type of system. And it's basically just PowerShell. I just wrapped it in a GUI. So I have this cool little thing, and I've got this script. So I want to find anytime SCCM updater is used. And what the script will do is, It'll pull that event log for me over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And the moment that I've got uh, anyone using that, it'll pop an alert. So I'll, I'll do this. It does this Honeycreds thing here, and it just, it's sitting there running, right? So let's go ahead and uh, delete my database here. And let me go ahead and respawn this. All right, I'm going to get Responder going and respawn this. And I'm going to do them again. I'll do converge, SCCM updater, really long password, right? Now, the moment that Responder will actually respond to the request, 
what will end up happening in here is I've got this tool, so it's just looking at my event logs. So responder is going to do its whole little handshake thing or whatever the case may be. But the moment that we get that, boom, I got you. What do you guys think? What do you guys think? And that's the cool thing is, is that this is, you already have access to all of this. It's just PowerShell and event logs. And now you've got me. Before I've even done anything, you have an indicator of compromise. And now you can go back and say, hey, we, we see someone's running responder on our network, whatever the case may be. So that's on the network side. But what about honeypots? You guys are probably using honeypots, right? And let me tell you, uh, most of y'all are setting up your honeypots wrong. If your honeypot responds to all 65,000 ports, I'm not touching it. Okay? It's not. You're setting up your honeypots wrong. It make it look legit. Make it look like it's actually, or put something legit up there. Make it, make it look like it's your Git server. Dude, that is so sick, right? Make it look like a legit Git server, and then when I go to clone it, it's like, haha, gotcha. That'd be awesome, right? Make it look legit. But look, see, see how this is working? And guess what? For me on the responder side, I have no clue that you just caught me. I have no idea that you just, that you're, that you're capturing these things. None. It's a great way to piss off a pen tester, by the way. So if you want to get back to them, that's, that's the way you do it. So, so we talked a little bit about what's wrong, but let's talk about, about some other defensive tricks, right? When you hire a pen tester, do they tell you what didn't work as much as they tell you what did? If you get a pen tester and they didn't say, you guys did a great job of detection, or we tried this but it didn't work, that could be a problem. Because how do you know what's working if the tester doesn't tell you? That's their job, right? Is to test whether things are working or not. Not just say, I broke your stuff, you're welcome, and have a nice day. It's also to identify this, the fact to say, hey, we tried to log in with all of those LinkedIn accounts and none of them worked. Right? That's what you want to hear because that's a bonus for you guys. So when you're looking at this, when you're doing these types of tests, make sure that they're actually telling you what's not working or what didn't work. For the love of all things pure, change your default passwords. It's super simple. Just, if you have a service, just type the service name, default password into Google. Guess what? They're all out there. It's super simple. Admin, admin, Cisco, Cisco, admin, blank. Admin password, admin pass. I try all of them. If you can authenticate to any of your services with any of those types of default passwords, that's a problem. Uh, brocade switches. Uh, for those who use it, I'm not going to have you raise your hands. Uh, for those who use a brocade switch, it's like a Cisco in the fact that uh, you can do like the typical Cisco commands and stuff like that. But what Brocade does as, as, a, as a convenience for the attacker is they also have a root login with a default password. It's like Brienne or something like that. I don't know. Maybe it was a girlfriend. But uh, when you log into it, it has wget. Now, a lot of these Brocade switches, these are backbone stuff, right? So the last thing I want to do is bring it down. So I set up a separate jump box. But the whole idea is that an attacker may not care, right? And now you've got, so if you have a brocade switch, you need to go look at those default passwords and turn it off. I got DA that way, with a brocade switch. Switch to DA. Expect your controls to fail. Expect your user education to fail. If you are in this industry and you're not expecting failure, you're, that's a problem. There is no such thing as perfection. Uh, Jeremy Nielsen uh, did a talk yesterday and he was talking about how even red teamers fail. Now, I am, I am perfect. Okay? I never fail, and I never do anything wrong. My stuff is always awesome. But no, expect it to fail. Expect people to click. Expect people to open things. That should be normal. Stop being in your blue team bubble. Go to the red team talks. Even if you may not fully understand, they're going to tell you stories of their attacks and methodologies, and hopefully some of the stories I've talked about, you guys might want to go back and be like, hey, hey, you know those brocade switches we got? 
<laughs> let's go ahead and change them. Go to the Red Teamer talks. It's not always about blue. Burn things to the ground. Not literally. Uh, 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 Netflix has this thing called uh, Chaos Monkey. Anyone ever heard of it? Ah, oh, dude. So what Chaos Monkey is, is it basically is this, it goes on, it goes to Amazon Web Services, and it starts turning things off. Like uh, releasing a simian into a data center. It just turns things off for you. It creates chaos. If you are not creating chaos in your environment, that's a problem. If everything has to be so planned out, all your pen tests have to be perfectly known, we have to know exactly what's going on, we can't have any chaos whatsoever, you are not ready for an attack. Because an attack is not methodical. Attack is not planned out. An attack is chaos. I will turn crap off. Right? Your team should be not be surprised when that happens. It shouldn't be, where's the incident response manual? What's the policy on this? What do we do? We found a rogue box. What's our procedure? I don't know. Where's Jim? Jim's on vacation. Where's Bob? Bob's not here right now. Well, what do we do? Well, it's Friday. We'll leave it till Monday. <laughs> See, I was, I was 13 years in infrastructure. I know how it works. You should not be, this should be normal. It should be normal when things break. It should be normal when things don't work right. If you're not burning things down, that's a problem. Now granted, when you burn things down, you get people that may not necessarily appreciate you quite nearly as much, right? Because we expect everything to work well. I love the dude in the other side. He's like, oh, that's Jim. I'm sitting back down. <laughs> Did you see the dude in the background? <laughs> He's like, no, I'm not touching that. That's not for me. I'm not, I'm not even, even going to go there, right? But that's the whole idea. Yes. Yes, it causes disruption. Yes, it's not ideal. But you should be prepared to handle those types of situations on the defensive side. Am I going to get my screen back? Sweet. Look at that. I should be prepared for this. There we go. Did we get it? OK, so I wrote this tool called the Kraken. And the Kraken is. Uh, it was designed as a defensive methodology that if I found out something that was going on in my box and I wasn't physically able to get there to figure out what was going on, um, I wanted it off my network. And so what it would do is it would go out to the box and hardware disable, not software, hardware disable the net, all of the NICs that are on the box. So I thought this was awesome and whatever the case may be, and I let my team use it. The unfortunate reality is, is that I set it up to where you could point it to all of our assets the entire domain. Uh, so it was a great way to rage quit. Because when you hardware disable, you can't remotely re-enable. That means you have to walk to every single box and re-enable those NICs. So if you want to rage quit, that's the way it is. Um, now, because I'm so sh short, like this isn't really the appropriate icon for the Kraken. It's kind of like this for me. But it should be chaos, right? That's something that you need in your environment. It's about detection. Can you detect? When you introduce that chaos, you should be able to see that on your, on, in your systems. Make sure that detection is your primary goal when you do a pen test. It's not so much stopping them, but it's, did you even see me doing anything? I did an event, and, I, and, and this guy was like, oh, we got you. We've got this awesome alert. We've got this awesome sim. We've got the best team. Whatever. So I'm testing for like a week. And I'm like, did you get anything? He's like, no, you probably haven't even started yet. I'm like, no, 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 I'm in. Um, I attempted to log into your Outlook 54,000 times. He's like, what? I'm like, well, yeah, your OWA, because, oh. How many of you guys are monitoring your OWA? See? It's about detection. Uh, I want to show you something else real quick. Um, a lot of you guys are scared of PowerShell. 
Um, and you're like, hey, well, we're just going to lock it down so that no one can use it. Uh, so I wrote a tool called not PowerShell. And it works the same exact way as, uh, you know, uh, you know what you would do in PowerShell. I can even do um, so. You can even you can just do PowerShell single commands. You can do encoded commands. You can do decoded commands. So if I'm dropping a binary and you're trying to b block PowerShell just at the binary, uh, it doesn't do you any good. It's not about deflecting. It's about detecting. We're gonna come up with ways to get around all of your tools, like the execution policy. Dude, there are 15 different ways to get around execution policy. And by the way, if I'm able to get to system, I can change that. So a lot of good that's going to do. Right? It's about detection. Knowing that you have an indicator of compromise. If you don't have that, your defensive methodology needs to change. So all of the stuff that I've shown you so far, Honeycreds, everything else like that, uh, PostSec framework, that's all out on GitHub. And guess what? It's free. Take it, do whatever you want. In fact, someone's already cloned it and not complimented me on it, so I'm okay with that. Um, uh, uh, I know that uh, uh, there's a, been a couple of new attack frameworks that come out that actually pulled code from Poshtech framework. So go out, grab Honeycreds. Um, I know a, I know a client that just used it on, a, on an engagement on an internal red team. He said his red team was super pissed and he was so excited. Um, uh, Jared Atkinson has some awesome stuff out there too. Um, really good guy. He's got Invoke IR. Um, it's cool PowerShell stuff. Um, a lot of stuff that Matt Johnson writes with PostSec. Um, PostSec framework is what I wrote, but all of the PostSec uh, love comes from Matt Johnson. So make sure you guys take a look at that. So in conclusion, oh, I'll go back so you guys can take another picture. So in conclusion, the idea here is don't get stuck on a single methodology. Come up with new and unique ways. Figure out what the bad guys are doing, and then go back and say, how can we detect that? How can we stop that? And if you don't know, talk to the presenter. Because they may, they may come and say, hey, I broke everything. But your job should be, how do I defend against that? They should be able to tell you, how do I defend against that? Detection is more important than deflection. Because the deflection will fail. It only works on the knowns. You have to worry. It has to be focused on that. So this is how you get a hold of me. Um, I answer email awesomely, uh, ben0xa.com. It's not benoxa, it's 0xa, it's hexadecimal for 10. Um, and all of the stuff I have uh, is out on GitHub. Uh, but thank you guys very much, I really appreciate it.